In this class, uh, we are going to discuss about ball and journal bearings. As you know by now, that uh, everything depends on our bearings. You know, we we put our transducers at the bearings, okay. But the bearings uh, themselves could be having fault. You know, so far we have discussed about faults in the rotating systems, be it the shaft misalignment, shafts having uh, unbalance, shafts having cracks in them. But eventually, all the measurements are done at the bearing locations, and we, in the earlier cases, we had assumed that the bearings were okay. But that is not true. Bearings themselves have so many rotating elements; they themselves could be defective. So we, in this class, we are going to focus on these two important classes of bearings: the ball bearings or the anti-friction bearings, and the journal bearings. Uh, in our class in rotor dynamics, we have seen the importance of journal bearings. Because of the fact that journal bearings can take huge amount of static loads onto them, and they are practically there, the shaft is actually supported on a fluid film, so there is no contact between the shaft and the journal. There is no metal-to-metal -metal contact, and they can take heavy loads. However, in the journal bearings, there are issues of stability, and in particularly in flexible systems. The stability in general bearing is of a critical concern, which is not apparently so in the case of anti-friction bearings. Okay, but in large gas turbines, you know, steam turbines, wherever we have general bearings, stability is very very important. So, the oil film thickness, the clearance between the journal and the shaft, all these, you know, the load on the shaft, the rotating speeds, all these uh, control the stability of the system. And that is very very important, which we will not discuss in this class, which we had uh, discussed, uh, I think, in the class on rotor dynamics. But uh, in this class, we are going to focus on what happens or what indications we get when there is a defect in the ball bearings and <coughs> defect in the journal bearings. Okay. So, uh, well, why do we have bearings? We have bearings to reduce friction between two moving parts, and the bearings support these rotating shafts. Okay. So, if I have a shaft, which is rotating, shaft is carrying a lot of weight. So, they have to be supported on bearings. And I have to give very, very less friction to the rotating element. That is my requirement. Less friction and support the load. So, one way to reduce less friction is to have them finely polished surfaces, hard surfaces which will not wear off and then they will support load. Another is put an oil film, now when you have this oil film here in a general bearing, you have an eccentricity okay, because of the converging diverging row, there will be this fluid pressure, the fluid here and because of the fluid pressure, this shaft is going to get lifted off the journal and then the shaft is going to support. So, we have the case of the journal bearing, and of course, the anti friction bearing. bearing. But in the journal bearing, particularly, there is a layer of oil or lubricant. Oil. It is actually this oil. So, this lubricating oil can give different amounts of friction depending on the z n by p, where z is the viscosity and p is the pressure of this oil, n is the speed r p m, and this is the famous Petrov's law. And then you will see that okay. I am sorry, 
some some extent this will go up okay. and this is the case of the boundary layer where the boundaries are almost touching mixed layer and then the hydrodynamic okay and uh, we are talking about bearing in this hydrodynamic region wherein the friction is less okay. so this anti friction bearing could be of many types could be ball bearings roller bearings basically an anti friction bearing has an outer race <coughs> an inner race and this could be the this is the outer race this is the inner race these are the rolling elements which are usually balls rollers or even sometimes tapered rollers and then there is a cage or a retainer which ensures that no two rolling elements come together a thin metal strip and they are actually they are actually riveted here and this is the cage or retainer at some times the inner race rotates with the shaft typical cases or sometimes the outer race rotates like in the case of the ceiling fan ceiling fan bearing the hub is actually stationary hub is attached to the ceiling the shaft coming so ceiling fans outer race rotates in typical other cases all the electric motors etc it's the inner race which is rotating rotates sometimes we call them as race or ring okay so uh, the idea behind this bearings anti friction bearing is they have to in any bearing they have to produce give less friction so to give less frictions they have to be moving very uh, moving without any uh, obstruction so these elements are manufactured to be very fine surface hard surface and they are lubricated once they come out of the factory they are lubricated at the factory and sealed forever okay, thin layer of lubrication okay and this is the first class uh, first type the anti friction bearing or the ball bearing or the roller bearing this is how it looks like and the hydrodynamic bearings basically we have uh, in the journals where there is pad and then where there are grooves for the oil to come in and so on and which we discussed in the case of hydrodynamics i will not go to general bearings right now we will focus more on the anti friction bearings and because most of the case of small machine sets they only have sets of anti friction bearings which could be uh, self aligning also okay so this is how what are the main components of a rolling element which we just uh, saw the inner race outer race the rolling elements could be either ball roller cylinder tapered roller needle etc cage separator retainer they are the same things okay 
Now, why do vibration signals from the bearings occur? That is the characteristics of vibration signals from the bearings, because once bearings are put on housings, I have a bearing here. And this is some some shaft, and I have put a transducer here. This is my transducer. So these shafts are carrying loads, okay, and sometimes these loads are directional. Speed may be fluctuating. So, the load coming to the system or the excitation coming to the bearings is varying with load, varying with speed. So, these are responsible for this vibration signal which is coming out of the bearings to modulate them. By modulate them, I mean suddenly the amplitude will increase, decrease. So, actually. So, this this sorry these are the amplitude modulations which are occurring because of the load and speed variations. Okay. On top of it this all these rolling elements have different rela relative motion. Okay one is the balls are for example, the balls are spinning about their own axis and also going about the um, about, about the about, about the circumference. This is if this outer race is fixed, okay, this inner race is rotating at an rpm n. So, I can assume that this is rotating at n by 2. Okay, the, the train the fundamental train train of this rolling uh, elements are moving at a speed of n by 2 okay this is a fair assumption because this is zero this is n n by 2 linear assumption okay so you see all these individual components the, the cage the inner race or the outer race one is either stationary either the inner race is stationary in the case of a ceiling panel like i told you or the outer race is stationary in the case of an electric motor so these elements are all rotating at different frequencies and that is what gives rise to the high frequencies in the even in a good bearing you will see sorry uh, even in a good bearing you will see these frequencies coming up in the vibration spectrum of the vibration which we measure the best part about the bearing vibrations is so for example if i have a shaft which are supported on bearings these are my bearings and I have put my transducer somewhere here. Transducers will record the 1 x vibration because of the rotational speed, but they will also rotate uh, find out the bearing frequencies plus bearing frequencies, but you will see the bearing frequencies you will calculate any time they are actually some fractions either 0.6 of x, 1.2 of x so, and they depend on the bearing geometry. By bearing geometry, I mean the pitch diameter, the ball diameter or the rolling element diameter, the number of balls small n, the rotational speed, the contact angle. So, these frequencies are no way related to 1 x, 2 x, 3 x which we saw in the case of rotating shafts and that is again why you will be wondering well always I am putting my transducers on the bearing mounts. What if the bearing frequencies are contaminating or mixing with my actual shaft defect frequencies of 
misalignment crack unbalance that will not happen because they are at different frequencies. The bearing frequencies themselves are at a different value compared to the shaft frequencies and that is actually helping us. And like I told you in spectrum analysis, every peak in the vibration spectrum corresponds to a particular defect in a particular mechanical element. It could be a bearing fault, it could be a shaft fault, it could be an unbalance, it could be a gearbox fault, they are all different frequencies and that is really, they are just really saved the work for us. Okay. But another thing also happens in the bearing is, because there is a defect in a bearing, a lot of high frequencies get generated and I will come to that just in a little while. But, uh, what are the sources of bearing vibration? Okay. So, once we manufacture this bearing, when you say this outer race, inner race to be a perfect circular ring, we manufacturing them through a grinding process, through a polishing process, through a buffing process to make a perfect circular ring. But after this ring has been manufactured, if you take a dial gauge and measure the ovality of this ring, it will not be circular. You will be surprised to know that it will be somewhat, uh, this is not a sharp peak here. But these variations a ring, a circle which should have been the green circle actually looks like this and this could be order of 2 micron, very very small, but this is there in a new bearing also and this is known as the waviness of the ring. or what is known as the out of roundness. Through a precision measurement, precise measurement of the wave of the surface profile, you will see that it is not a perfect circle, it is something like this. So, bearing manufacturers when they manufacture bearing, they ensure that they have do good amount of finishing operations in the buffing final polishing operations, so that this happens. And on top of it, if you will see that we have this rolling elements actually riding on these waves. Okay. So, if you if you put it flat on a surface so, we have a wavy surface on which these rolling elements are moving. This train is moving at a high speed. So, this gives rise to the vibration response. In vibration, you must have studied when you go over a wavy surface, what kind of amplitudes you get. All of you must have experienced going on a motorbike on a wavy road would have experienced those uh, amplitudes coming up. Same thing happens in a bearing. So, this is why even in a good bearing, we have vibrations because of the out of roundness while they have manufactured it. Okay. On top of it, if you look at another important component that is the surface roughness of the components. This surface it was any of the surface was supposed to be manufactured all the surfaces were supposed to be manufactured as nice flat surface with an R A of the of the central line average of the surface roughness to be very, very low. 
but if you look under the microscope there will be lot of valleys and pits and this is because of the valleys and pits valleys and peaks and they are not smooth they have an surface roughness so imagine a rough surface moving over another rough surface this rough, rough surface could be that of a ball or a rolling element or a roller riding on an inner race and outer race which also has a surface roughness and which is wavy and this is what is actually there in a bearing at a microscopic level so all this wavy surfaces they are having motion and that is why this vibrations come even if you have a good bearing now to reduce this manufacturers what they do is they ensure that they have good amount of manufacturing operations in terms of polishing operations on top of it at the factory when the bearings are manufactured they put a layer of lubricant right once the bearings are manufactured so this lubricants will go into these pits and valleys and make try to make a smooth surface so if you hold a new bearing and if you just play around with the bearing you will not feel any roughness to your hand because of these uh, lubrications to remove the lubrication if you take this new bearing and wash it with kerosene and remove the lubricant you can all do that and feel it you will feel feel very uh, too much too much amount of roughness in your feel because the vibrations have increased because you have removed the lubricant by washing it with kerosene okay so that is the reason why new bearings also have vibrations it is not true that new bearings will not have vibrations new bearings have vibration because of these two reasons waviness and surface roughness on top of it things become more complicated in the sense let's come to this uh, case of the presence of dirt now imagine on a surface smooth surface you suddenly come across a bump or a pothole so these and then you have a rolling element so these bumps or potholes these bumps could be because of presence of a dirt on the surface of the inner rays and outer rays very hard silica particles sand particles they are very hard they will not disappear so they, they are going to scratch scrape the surfaces they are going to corrode or if there are some scratch markers there is like potholes so imagine when you go on a bicycle over a pothole you get this impulse so these rolling elements are subjected to a force of this nature an impulse force in the time domain if you look at the force they are subjected to a pulse like this and this is an impact force so this <coughs> rolling element which are rotating in the inner or the outer rays are subjected to such impact forces because they came in contact with a hard dirt particle which is like a bump on the road or there is a, there are some pits on the inner rays because of some you know corrosion something has happened there is a pitting mark some scratch marks so these impacts basically these forces impact the bearing's elastic structure is a bearing has mass bearing has elasticity so bearing also has a natural frequency of its own bearing has a natural frequency k by m it has mass it has a stiffness so it has a natural frequency now if you look at the frequency response of an impact force it is basically a random force in the frequency domain an impact would look like this force impulse short time force would have lot of frequency uh, lot of forces in the frequency domain a uh, white noise now imagine if the bearing's equation if i write
some force and this force happens to f sin omega t where it is omega is equal to 1 to infinite for that matter because this this goes all the way up so that means this bearing is getting excited at all frequencies agreed why did they get excited at all frequencies because there of this impact force or impulse force so the right hand side of this equation has got all the frequency components now it may happen so these are the forcing frequency it may so happen that the forcing for, uh, frequency is equal to the natural frequency of the rolling element bearing has been designed so and we always design a bearing to ensure that its natural frequency of a bearing of the bearing is away from the operating frequency. By operating frequency means I mean the shaft rotating speed and few harmonics of it. So, it should not interfere in the operating frequency. Usually a bearings uh, natural frequency are in the order of 20 to 30 kilohertz because we never operate at these frequencies. So, the bearing would never undergo a resonance conditions, but the problem is because I have excited it here by an impulse uh, force which has all the frequencies, the natural frequency gets excited. So, I will have a large response at its high frequency. Okay. So, resonance of components occur Oh, that means, the bearings have got excited at its natural frequency. So, if I see a high frequency vibration in the order of 20 to 30 kilohertz in the ultrasonic range, if I see a high increase in the vibration level, I can say for surely a uh, bearing has undergone a fault. Okay. And that is what actually people use in an instrument called as a shock pulse meter. So, shock pulse meter is actually nothing but an handheld instrument for bearing fault detection. It is nothing but an high frequency bearing vibration measurements. So, basically essentially a uh, high frequency 20 to 30 kilohertz vibration measuring uh, measurement or monitoring device and because high frequency vibration occurs in defective bearings because the resonant frequency of a defective race because of a pit scratch dirt gets excited and you know the physics why it got excited because I excited the right hand side of the equation by a forcing function which happens to have the natural frequency of the system. Obviously, so resonance happened and then I have high frequency vibrations. So, a bearing vibration a bad bearing vibra uh, vibration would have the frequencies of these inner rays, outer rays, uh, cage, uh, retainer etcetera plus a sure case to say that the bearing has failed is when you see a high frequency vibration in the um, 20 to 30 kilohertz range. Okay. So, uh, to understand this we did a small experiment in the lab and basically what we have here is a motor uh, driving a 6 to 0 3 bearing okay. and all we have to do is uh, put an accelerometer and put a filter have a ni data equation card and we take all the data to the computer and then we have a photoelectric probe to measure the rotational speed because as you will see every the, all the bearing frequencies are dependent on the rotational speed of this uh, shaft and uh, these frequencies can actually be calculated and in fact the rolling element bearing defect frequencies, we can call them as defect frequencies, we can call them as bearing frequencies as also and they are given by these equations. The outer rays defect frequency is given by n by 2 times r p m by 60 times 1 minus ball diameter by pitch diameter times cosine of the contact angle beta okay. and 1 is minus 1 is plus and then the ball defect frequencies where small n is the number of balls 
RPM is the relative rotational speed between the inner and outer rays, B d is the ball diameter, P d is the pitch diameter and T is beta is the contact angle. So, these can be uh, calculated from uh, the bearing manufacturer, where the, all the bearing manufacturer give, give this data. Some of them give only the ball diameter, not, not the pitch diameter. Sometimes they do not give the catalog uh, in the catalogs the number of balls, but you can always find them at um, in the internet or measure them or talk to the manufacturer. So here, what we have done uh, in uh, this experiment is, we took a six two zero three bearing. Okay, which had a ball diameter of 6.747 millimeters, pitch diameter of 28.7 millimeters, the number of balls in the rolling uh, element bearing was 8, contact angle was 0, so cosine beta is 1, speed of motor it was running at 1800 rpm is 30 hertz. So, this motor was running at 1800 rpm, we have a bearing here and in this bearing actually we had a series of 6203 bearings manufactured uh, by a company uh, who wherein we could artificially create defects in the inner rays by putting an electric scratch mark through an electric itching pen. We could uh, create scratch marks in the rolling elements, we could create scratch marks in the outer rays. So, uh, then we one by one we introduced we manufactured bearings defective bearings and put them in this rig and then we measure the vibrations. So, uh, the theoretically calculated values for a rotational speed of 30 hertz, the fundamental train frequency is 11.4 hertz, ball spin frequency is 60.3, uh, outer rest frequency is 91.8, inner rest is 148.2. You will see here nowhere this wall the bearing frequencies are multiples of 30 hertz. There are some decimal fractions of the inner rays, outer rays uh, or, or the, of the rotational speed. So, that is a good indicator. Now, this one here, just to give you a feel of the bearing vibrations, how they look like when there is no defect and there is a lot of defect. So, when there is no defect, the amplitude levels of vibrations are very, very low. If you compare to the second one, which is a case of a defective bearing and if you look at the time history, they are almost periodic. Okay, and then there are very small peaks, but the magnitude is very very low 0 0.01. But in this case, we have bearings which were there were a lot of defects, and you will see this impact nature. Okay, this is because of the potholes or the dirts, so it is ringing. Okay. So, this is if you look just look at the time domain signal of a good vibration from a bearing and a bad vibration of a bearing, you can right away say looking at it, this is a bad bearing. Okay. So, you will see time domain analysis itself is very, very helpful to identify bearing faults. And if you will do the feature calculation from these signals, like its mean RMS, you will see obviously the RMS value of this is much higher than this, but there are factors like the kurtosis of the bearing signals. If I measure the kurtosis, you will see the kurtosis values of these bad bearings are pretty pretty much high, more than about four or five, and then you can say for sure that this is a bad bearing. And this is how the spectrum looks like. Now the earlier example was for the case of the time domain. Okay, and then these are both time histories. The same now has been converted to the frequency domain and from 0 to 500 you will see for a good bearing the amplitudes are low and you see the fundamental train frequency and the shaft frequency showing up nothing else. But once you have defective bearing first of all the amplitudes are high and almost in this case the, there was an inner rest defect, the ball defect or outer rest defect all these frequencies are showing up. Okay, and these are sure cases and in this bearing we are not even monitoring the high frequency vibrations I told you about 20 to 30 kilohertz. Okay, but the reason I told you to monitor the high frequency vibrations from 20 to 30 kilohertz is for the fact that bearings are actually put in systems where could there could be uh, frequencies of faults 
from other uh, defects like in shaft misalignment, unbalance, etcetera. So, they will smear the spectrum. Okay. It will be very difficult for you to distinguish many frequencies other defect frequencies, okay. unless you have a very, very fine resolutions or really a good eye for it. Okay. So, a sure test is that high frequency monitoring through a shock pulse measurement. Okay, and this is how this waviness and uh, uh, out of roundness looks like. So, this is the good wearing uh, acceleration signal. Okay. This is the bearing signal with outer race defect. Okay, you can measure. Okay, uh, you see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Point 0.2 by 18 uh, that would be approximately how much? About 0.3 is it? Oh no, time period is 0.2 seconds. So, 200 by 18. 0 0.01 seconds. Okay. Okay, and this is 1 by 30 is actually 0 0.3, isn't it? 0 0.03. Okay. Anyway, you can actually looking at this, you can say whether uh, the more uh, what is the spatial spacing of these defects, whether two defects are there or one defect are there. In fact, I am not sure about what defect we have uh, put here. Okay, um, but this is that no defect case, only with outer race defect. Okay, the multiples come up. It's not only the single frequencies, but also their multiples. Yes, two outer race, uh, race defects, 180 degree apart. In this case, what we did is we created one defect here. And another defect here. Okay. And this is for the inner race defect. Sometimes you will see the shaft frequency is showing up because the inner race is attached to the shaft. And here, when we have the ball defect only defects in the ball, the ball frequencies will show up. And how are these frequencies calculated? This is inner race, outer race and ball, all three were there. Okay. What I am going to show you is, uh, I am sorry, these equations. So, these equations are there in the books. These equations you can know, only thing that you have to know the ball diameter, pitch diameter and, contact and find out this and then you can find out. Okay, so uh, this is usually what you will see when you measure the vibrations out of a bearing, in case of the defect free, and in case of defect. Okay, and this kurtosis value gives you an indication as to why this faults, uh, whether the fault has occurred in the bearing itself. Okay, you blindly pass it through a signal processor, processor, wherein you just calculate the kurtosis of the time domain signal. And usually, kurtosis gives the peakiness of the signal okay and usually kurtosis value is greater of more than 5 is case of a defective case and less than 3 is the normal case okay because if this bearing faults go unnoticed. For example, a crack in a bearing outer race, if it goes unnoticed, we are going to have problems, the bearings are going to fail. 
Okay. And many a times, I will I'll tell you in other case studies, in a, many a times when uh, in a, particularly in electrical motors, when there is a electrical uh, conductance occurring through the bearings, because the shafts carry are carrying rotors okay, and there is a lot of magnetic flux and this flux gives rise to small ground voltages okay. and this uh, at the bearings because of the oil film that is a sparking very significant sparking occurs. So, if this grounding is not done properly the sparking is going to occur and the sparking is going rise giving rise to pits. So, if a bearing goes dry not lubricated not properly care for pitting marks will occur pitting occurs because of electrical sparking. So, this is going to give rise to uh, the initiation of these defects. Okay. Uh, so, good bearing has to be lubricated made kept in dirt free environment and ensure that pitting dirts do not enter and then you also do not overload the bearing more than it was designed for. So, bearings if they go unnoticed eventually if a bearing fails your machine has failed your shaft is going to come down loads are going to come down everything is going to fail. Misalignment in the shaft is going to give rise to a high axial force sometimes in the general bearings parallel bearings you will see a lot of ununiform wear occurring. Ununiform wear again gives rise to ununiform uh, clearances and then the forces are going to vary, the support forces are going to vary. Again, this give rise to fatigue loading. So, it is actually a dominoes effect kind of one leads to another. Okay. So, we have to be careful whether you know who came first. So, I will give you a, uh, at the closer, I will just talk about a small uh, case in a particularly in a paper mill, wherein uh, we have to be careful about the uh, supporting the bearings which are there in the uh, number of rolls which are there in a bearing. So, this is the flow chart of a paper mill. Basically, you have the uh, this area where the pulps etcetera come, okay, the paper pulp etcetera come and then uh, they are shredded and are mixed with uh, the uh, caustic soda etcetera cleaned, bleached, impurities removed and this uh, pulp, paper pulp is actually fed through a, a wire press, wherein there is a steel wire which is going in and then basically they are pressed here in the first stage, so that the water is squeezed out from this pulp. Okay. And this pulp is you know this black line is made to pass through rollers, wherein we do a lot of drying. So, initially once you dry this wet pulp okay, and then, then slowly this uh, paper is going to be get formed and paper will be they pass through about 20 30 dryer big drying drums and each are supported on rollers on bearings and bearings are what uh, and they are steam dried there are steams going through these drums and eventually at the end they are you know hot pressed after the dryer and that's called as the calendaring operation and finally they are put into roll and then the rolls uh, go to the market so, in the if you will see in a typical paper mill, there are about 200 to 300 rolls, just rolls rotating at and a typical speed is about 1000 meters per minute. This at that speed, a 1000 meters per minute, this paper come out at about 1000 meters per minute okay, and then roll. And typical production is about 80, uh, uh, 80 tons uh, per uh, day, you know, 80 tons of paper per day, particularly the news prints. Okay. And this bearings, if one bearing fails, the, because this is operation in series, the, everything has to be shut down. So, these bearings have to be monitored around the clock. And this is one view of the um, press section near the washer, wherein uh, the, uh, the pulp has been fed. This is a wire onto which this uh, the takeoff roll. It is a very big roll, you, know, you can see my uh, student standing there, it is about 1 meter to 2 meter in diameter okay. and then they go in through this rolls and then and this is the pressing section, there are a uh, few presses here and, and other side and you will see this uh, rolls coming in here and in this particular plant and, and then you will see a lot of this drums, okay, big drums and in one drum, uh, one side of the uh, drums 
that are actually steam going in heating the drum. So, drums are very hot. Okay. So, that because the water has to be dried after you have pressed and removed the water from the paper pulp, it has to be now dried over series of rolls okay. and then uh, these are the bearings I, mean, I have another view. Uh, yeah, Every roll there is a bearing, there is a bearing here, the bearing here and you will see in such a plant the bearings are monitored by vibration. You will see this white lines here, this is a bearing transducer here, this is another bearing transducer here, another bearing transducer here. So, around the clock vibration monitoring of this uh, uh, rolling uh, bearings are being done because and then there are diagnostic algorithms wherein uh, people can uh, know which vibration signal is coming from which bearing, what is its kurtosis value, what is its spectrum value okay. and if you because these are very very critical operation because imagine if one rail roll breaks and falls it is going to damage few other rolls it is going to damage few other bearings and to put everything together you can imagine the problem one has to face. Okay. So, everywhere depending on the criticality of the equipment or the process of the plant monitoring of rolling element bearing is essential okay. and particularly in paper mills etcetera this uh, monitoring of bearings is done sometimes continuously online through these and nowadays the state of the art is right at the bearings they are having transmitters wireless transmitters. So, that in a complicated plant you need not have all this cabling coming to a uh, junction rather you have over the wireless and with the proper routers you have the signals you know which are coming in and then sitting somewhere remotely in the control room you can know which bearing signal is where and people are now in, in fact monitoring them over the internet. Okay sitting in Kharagpur you can be monitoring a plant in you know, in Malaysia ok it is possible ok it is no longer a science fiction ok you could be having your uh, paper mill in uh, in Spain and you, know, you can be monitoring the bearing at Kharagpur ok and then uh, you can be giving them uh, diagnostic uh, measures they have to take ok. Ok thank you that will be enough it.